Thank you all for coming today to lunch and uh, welcome again. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote lunch speaker today, Mariam Golmaragi. Uh, she is the uh, Director of Climate Change and Environment at the Geneva Association. And over the last 25 years, her career has spanned working as a senior executive, founder, uh, entrepreneur, and serving on advisory boards in private and public sectors and the UN. She has launched, led, and managed transformative climate change initiatives and multi-stakeholder multi partnerships with systemic impacts to enable transitioning to a resilient, low-carbon economy. Since 2015, she's been at the Geneva Association which is the strategic international think tank whose members are CEOs of the 90 largest insurance companies on a, on a global basis. Uh, working with corporate boards and CEOs, regulatory and standard setting bodies, FinTech and InsurTech firms, governments and policymakers, just about everybody. She leads strategic initiatives to innovate and scale up insurance industries, contributions as risk managers and investors, to transi transitioning to a lower carbon economy. And her work is focused on the things that she's gonna talk about today. So Mariam, thanks thank very you. much for being here. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. You know, I always feel very uncomfortable to break, to you know come in between your lunch, but uh, maybe I can inspire some thinking that's gonna take you forward in your career. Let me uh, show you, um, I think I need to know how to move. Okay. Do, do I do it that way? Oh, perfect. Okay, this is the Board of Geneva Association. And don't worry, don't worry. We are, we are, we are, get, we are getting more women. We just had two ladies. <laughs> Two ladies that one retired and one uh, decided to leave. So, but here I want to raise your attention. Currently filling two board seats, and they are women. So, uh, Geneva Association is a very interesting entity. Uh, by nature of directly working with the CEOs, I have a lot of power in terms of mobilizing, activating, inspiring, highly strategic areas that no individual company can make a difference, but this industry as a force can make a difference. So the way I run my projects is by bringing the industry together to collaborate and also build extensive cross-sectoral partnerships to work on issues that um, you know, we foresee, we are forward-looking in the next five to 10 years are gonna be foundational in the way this industry will play a role. And my, my space obviously is building a more resilient economy and, and, and decarbonization. Let me give you a flavor of like what I'm talking about. Uh, how many of you have heard about climate litigation? Okay, so we did a massive study on characterizing climate litigation by bringing seven leading lawyers in the world and a team of 40 experts, we went through 1,800 cases of litigation as early as three years ago, when this was not on anybody's, uh, you know, sort of radar. We classified, we broke it down into seven ways litigation can come to corporations and governments. <clears throat> what does that mean for liability side of insurance? What does that mean for investors? What does it mean for boards? So that's like a typical type of things to stay ahead of, of the curve. Another one was by bringing 18 regulatory bodies that are, have been leading the whole climate risk analytics and reporting, Bank of England, France, uh, others, and several in US, and a team of 90 experts across the balance sheet from uh, life and uh, PNC insurers I led a task force over the last four years, and you may be very interested to look at the three reports. We really mapped climate risk, physical transition litigation on both sides of the balance sheet, across the balance sheet. We had very in-depth conversation with the regulators. The, and our position was doing 
single scenario or limited scenario deterministic analysis of climate risk on an element of balance sheet can only be misleading and resource intensive. We need to rethink climate risk assessment so that it produces decision useful information for the companies to steer in this highly uncertain uh, environment and produce decision useful information for the regulators. For, so we've asked regulators, what is your regulatory objective? Reporting for sake of reporting is not good enough. We came up with eight priorities of the regulators, and then we didn't uh, quit there. We asked them what questions you want to be asking the insurance companies. So actually, we, launched, we, we embarked on those questions. We mapped it on the insurance business model. That's your first level guidance for a company to do strategic climate risk assessment with forward-looking approach that's going to help it make good decisions, but also provide relevant information. So we are about shifting the narrative towards meaningful information, meaningful decision-making and advancing the solution with practical solutions on the ground. <clears throat> it's stuck again, shout, shout. Oh, okay. So believe it or not, there are a number of issues that are keeping me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously one of them was dealt with this morning with rising risk associated with extreme events. How do we keep insurance affordable and available in the market? I am from Boston, but I live in Vancouver, Canada, in the mountains, and my insurance prices have gone four times because of the fire risk, right? So I not only worry about this professionally, but personally. How can we keep insurance available and affording the market. And today, I will tell you, I listened very carefully this morning, and I wanna challenge that we need to evolve our conversation. Our conversation has gotten stuck in the world of insurance and regulators, but who creates the risk and why? Who owns the risk? Who has the mandate or ability to manage that risk? because ultimately insurance is about transferring the residual risk. And this residual risk is going up for reasons I will get it. So I wanna to talk to you about that because that's gonna be the next initiative I'm going to launch in May. And by the way, I love to talk to the lady from Colombia. You're doing outstanding. And I'm talking to Ishita next week. Amazing. Okay, the second question is, ladies and gentlemen, all that we are discussing about keeping insurance affordable and affordable. If we do not implement climate mitigation, cost of adaptation is prohibitive. So the second question that I'm pondering is, can I get that incredible force, 24 trillions of asset under management, more than two thirds of commercial insurance market, that's my membership, to help expedite unlocking financing and expedite market readiness of all these new technologies, green hydrogen, carbon removal storage, sustainable aviation, all these good stuff that we want, we need to transition the energy. Can we expedite that? Because at the end, climate change is an issue of urgency and scale. Okay, so by looking and working in the nitty gritty of things, yes, it's important. But how do we deal with the urgency at scale? So question number one, a lot of it we've heard about this today, rising frequency, severity, and geographic level, weather extreme, yeah, nobody has any questions about that. But clearly, this is being deeply exacerbated by the way we, where and how we are building. Bottom line. When you go to get permits where to build, right? You should have a right to know what's the risk of building in that area. When you go to bank to get a mortgage, our mortgages are not risk-based. Whether you live on the coast or whether you live away the coast, you get the same mortgage, it's all about what the interest rates are, right? Your valuation of your home, if you live on the coastline, our valuation has been great views wonderful ocean path, more expensive. And now we know that that's actually should be the opposite. So we stand at a risk 
of many good citizens who have put their equity in their homes based on those value system losing their equity, bottom line. So it's really the way we have concentrated people and their assets in high risk zone. But you know, it's you know, flooding just doesn't happen because you live by the ocean or by the river. It can happen in your city because of the way we are urbanizing, the way we are developing our aging infrastructure, connection of supply chains, inflation. Those are really the things that are exacerbating that residual risk that we are asking insurers to transfer. Now, we know insurance losses are going up. We heard about that. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, economic losses are by far more than insurance losses. On average, insurance losses are about a third of economic losses, right? So, is and, and it's growing, right? Because we heard today that insurers are not profitable delivering their services in certain states. We, we heard many reasons, but economic losses are going up. And in the absence of, now let's start using a risk reduction, reducing risk of what we've built and preventing how we are going to build forward, right? Some risk may not be insurable and it's going to require a different intervention, right? We need to shift our paradigm and really bring it to the focus of what risks how we can manage it, and how we can transfer it. Now, the worst part of it is if we don't move fast, cost of all this adaptation that we need to do today, it's going to be prohibitive. Okay, so we cannot do, uh, you know, adaptation without mitigation. Yes, should I just, I'll, I'll just do it. Uh, here we go. Yes. Okay, let me ask, add more complexity, things that I haven't. All day today, we've talked about direct risk. You know, the extreme event happens and it causes damage and disruption, you know, so direct loss. Um, we haven't talked about other things. So first, let me talk about physical transition and litigation risk. You've heard about these terms before. I don't need to go. Has anybody not heard about physical transition and litigation risk in context of climate? Great. So let me look, tell you how this is going to work. A few days ago, I got a call from US Department of Energy. You know that our country is putting nearly 1 trillion of subsidies into deployment of climate technologies for industrial, expediting our industrial decarbonization. The question was, we are deploying 3 billion in building solar plants in Puerto Rico, but we cannot, attract enough insurance capacity. Part of it has to do with the fact of how these projects are being designed. What kind of equipment are being applied to build the, to, to, to build the project? How are we actually building the project to make sure that the solar plant is protected against flood on one hand, but hail on the other, right? And by designing these projects with the right equipment and with the right build, the projects are going to be a lot more expensive. And developers want to keep the cost of these projects down so that they can apply for financing, but then they hit the insurers because financing will not be available without insurance. And this is becoming a serious problem. So I'm, I'm trying to give you, so that is where transition risk can be hindered because of physical risk and not being able to manage it. And, you know, a lot of the cases of litigation that's coming against corporations and governments are because lack of management of physical climate risk. Um, direct indirect compounding. Um, somebody asked about extreme heat this morning. I can't remember who it was, but let me give you how this works. So I worked in my life on development of heat health early warnings. The French heat health early warnings, we build it in the EU and that has saved lives, right? But when you have extreme heat, let's remember the 2022 um, uh, uh, heat waves in, in Europe. Uh, because of the heat waves, um, the temperature of the rivers was risen. On the other hand, because of the heat waves, the, the level of river, rivers were lowered. 
Now, when you look at a country like France, which is run by nuclear power, right? They couldn't cool their nuclear plants. And also they couldn't produce enough uh, hydroelectric power. And as a result, a country that is a, 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 a producing country of energy started to import energy, right? A lot of disruptions in business. So we not only have the direct, but we have the indirect risk. Whenever it, an infrastructure is damaged, that has massive amount of impact on economic development and then compounding risk. The same year, half of the fleet of nuclear was down because of technological risk. So all of a sudden, Europe is faced with a serious energy crisis, which was exacerbated by the Ukraine-Russian war. And all of a sudden we are in a reaction to that. So what I'm trying to say is our view of risk has been quite limited. The models that we have developed, and I spend a lot of my career in doing NatCat modeling and, and rethinking about development of those models. Those are great tools, but we need to go further. We were talking about forward-looking climate risk analytics. And, and um, you know, that's where we need to go. And, you know, when we talk about data, I spend a lot of my time mentoring climate risk analytics firm, the up and coming. And I would say, we are on the verge of a breakthrough to do forward-looking stochastic climate risk modeling. That's a whole new lecture, a new topic. I will cover that another time. But I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, the data issue is being dealt with uh, extensively and so on. But one thing I wanted to tell you is I'm launching a major initiative around that question, how to keep insurance affordable and available. And I'm gonna be taking a system-based approach. We really need to look at the system. If I'm taking housing, for housing, we need to see how we are getting permits, where we are getting permits, what are the rules for building? So that brings the local and the state government in, right? Then we need to look at the valuation of the home, the mortgage of the home, these are the long-term issues. We need to look at insurance, but also we also need to look at federal government's action. Whenever there is a disaster, a penetration of insurance in the United States is limited because everybody thinks, oh, I'm gonna get money from post-disaster aid. We need to reform those programs to become more proactive. So it's going to look at a system-based approach. I think my colleague from Swiss Re talked about risk-based premiums. The price of insurance is a reflection of amount of risk that we need to manage. So we need to look at that assets life cycle. We cannot just think about, I'm going to buy a home and I'm gonna get, you may not have insurance two years, three years, four years down the road. The same thing for industrial facilities and infrastructure system. We need to think long-term and Enabling and incentivizing risk mitigation. Alice, your words were music to my ear. So what we need to do is who is going to pay for the retrofit of what we've built? But we have hope for whatever we are building forward. We can put the checks and balances not to say make the same mistakes of building for the climate of the past. We need to build for the climate of the future. Um, and then what is the implication for business models, products and service innovation, opportunities for public-private partnership, and financial services regulatory roles. So I really look forward to that. Now, let me just, I don't know how much time I have, if I can be warned maybe, because I want to give you something very exciting. I have almost slept two hours a night, but with excitement. <laughs> not, not because I was worried. Four years ago, after having done quite extensive research, I went before my board and I said, yes, we need to deal with all those issues that I just shared with you, but there is an opportunity. As the world is going to move towards decarbonization, we're going to need a whole range of new untested technologies that needs to come to market and be adopted by various sectors. Are you ready? Because without insurance, 
no insurance, no finance, no project, no decarbonization. Are we ready? Assessing insurability conditions of new technologies takes time, right? So uh, I build a massive partnership, including 12 largest insurance insurance companies, three managing general agents. From a finance perspective, Breakthrough Energy, this is Bill Gates' platform that's putting billions of dollars into climate tech. HSBC, US Department of Energy across the department. Um, one of the leading engineering firms, a mission possible partnership. It's a, it's a, it's an, a platform that was established by WEF and Rocky Mountain Institute. Now it's independent that has all the corporations from key sectors. And what did we do? First of all, only in the last three years, we are seeing that stars are aligning, that the world is starting to get organized to expedite decarbonization. Why? We are seeing transformative public policy and government subsidies. US is leading the pack with IRA, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, and semiconductor act roughly comes to about one trillion of subsidies. Markets are starting to align their coalition of different governments and corporations that are aligning to become off takers of new technologies. Coordinated capital, you know, groups such as Bill Gates and so on are bringing all these money into one pool to invest at scale beyond government. Obviously, sustainable finance and reporting tools, that is going to enable institutional investors that traditionally invest in later stages to get organized, pension funds, insurance companies, long asset managers, massive development innovation technology, and the most, and then shifting geopolitics of energy following what happened in the summer of 2022 in Europe, all of a sudden you saw country after country, starting with United States, issuing what's called their national strategy for special materials that are needed for development of green tech. So all of a sudden we are thinking, it's not just about oil and gas, it's about lithium, uranium, copper. So how are we going to get all those materials in? Two, three minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, so you see the world is mobilizing, right? And um, when you look at seven industries that are listed here, they account for more than 30% of, of emissions. And let me, you know how we have all these climate targets. By 2030, we need to be here. By 2050, we need to be here. If we are going to have any luck at scaling up decarbonization, these are examples of what needs to happen in these industries. Aviation, today we produce 0.24 uh, million tons per annum of SAP. We need to be at 40 by 2030. Steel, shipping, just this gives you just to start thinking about meeting these targets, where do we need to be on the ground? What are the problems? Massive financing gap. This project, the first of a kind project is costing about 30, 40, 50, 100 million dollars for a green hydrogen plant, right? Who's gonna put that kind of a money when the risks are untested, right? These are big issues. Um, so a significant portion of these technologies are in pre-commercialization and there is massive issues with, uh, you know, finding money, uh, they're highly compressed, untested risk, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where insurance will come in. Maybe I can have three slides and I wrap up. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it took 40 years for solar to become cost effective. And even today, solar energy has not realized its market potential. We don't have 40 years, do we? <laughs> right? So the question becomes, how are we going to bring all these other technologies to market? Right? If it took, because this really was developed based on 
the old way of commercializing technology. The old approach of commercializing technology is the technology gets developed in the lab and then ultimately with concessionary money from government, from philanthropy, from venture capital, it comes into deployment, right? Ultimately, insurers get involved after the technological risks are understood in later stages because the risks are understood, they start looking into what the risks are, what kind of products, they put the products together and they start supporting, they start taking parts of this risk pool. That's how it has happened in the past. Now, US Department of Energy two years ago issued something that's fundamental called the Adoption Readiness Level Framework. What it means is even you advance a technology and demonstrate technological risk, right? There are so many different risks that's gonna hold back that technology to get deployed to the market. So they talked about, um, uh, you know, these are the general technological, they talked about market related issues, things to do with manufacturing and supply chain. Today we were talking about building homes. Imagine you want to now build big industrial plants and you need equipment. You need contractors to build them. Those are all material sourcing, workforce, infrastructure, and then obviously the whole license to operate, regulatory environment, public policy. So many things has to work with, in alignment to get this technology out. And then here we came along and said, oh, excuse me, there's one other thing. No insurance, no finance, no project, no transition. You need to put insurability and access to insurance for these new technologies upon your thing. And this was immediately adopted. What that means is, is that um, now we are getting into this race saying insurers need to be part of this solution to get in earlier through its risk engineering and start exploring the insurability conditions, start exploring issues of data, start exploring what is it that is gonna be needed. Maybe some of these risks are not gonna be insurable. And guess what? Through our research, we found that for carbon removal and storage, which is a big topic for everyone, this technology cannot be uh, uh, scale for one reason. US government will not issue permits at the level that's needed to meet 2030 targets for one reason, long-term durability of storage. What if CO2 escapes in 30 years time from underneath the ground? And that has led to a whole new development between insurance industry, US Department of Energy to start exploring those. So what we did actually as part of our work, and those are available in the reports, is we have come up with eight reasons why insurance industry needs to get involved from pre-commercialization stages of the technology to address the data issue, to build the relationship, to get access to projects, to build pools for insurance, the scope of what actually could reasonably be insurable through commercial markets, and then development of standards, development of risk mitigation solutions for these some pretty dangerous technologies and subsequently standards for how you build to be able to replicate so that we are not in the same boat as we are in the housing sector today. Um, together with, um, you know, all these partners, we also develop what's called an insurability readiness framework. It's a list of risk from insurance lens and issues that any climate tech developer, investor, government needs to consider. 80% of these technologies are coming to market by entrepreneurial firms. These are firms that do not have experience with risk management and with insurance. And um, with that, I would say um, we still have some challenges. I'm uh, launching phase two of the project. 
um, you can all get access to, to my presentation, but I will end with this. Um, you know, if I were to summarize my career, my career is around building trust across entities that traditionally have not thought about or for some reason have not worked together that must be working together to find the solutions. I would say, you know, I'm super specialized. We are all super specialized. We are living the world of last century where to solve problems, we broke it up into pieces and then each of us started becoming specialized in each piece. And now we realize that tackling the biggest issue is going to be at interfaces of our disciplines. So my thought is we need to rewire on our own heads. We need to break down our institutional silos because, you know, let's take uh, insurance solutions of future. Clients are going to need integrated solutions. We need to bring teams of risk engineers and underwriters around the uh, around the I haven't even shown you what a complex green hydrogen project looks like, and then you will understand. And then we really need to build those unprecedented sectoral uh, collaborations to find new ways of doing business and to find it quick. And I can tell you, we found one in 18 months. It's being adopted by Department of Energy, several of the banks, a breakthrough as a starting point. But those are the bigger investors in climate tech. And I would say that's a pretty good starting point. Thank you so much for your time.